Um, so as Kate said, this is a course in the virtues of objectivism. I'm going to be covering uh, eight in total. Uh, in this sequence, pride, then rationality and honesty tomorrow, uh, integrity, uh, productiveness, independence, and for the last session, uh, speaking about justice and benevolence. Uh, seven of these are the major virtues Ayn Rand discusses in the Objectivist Ethics and Atlas Shrugged, and the eighth is uh, on benevolence that David Kelly has argued for in his monograph on rugged individualism and I think has made a convincing case about. So I'm gonna be talking about that as well. We're gonna see how these virtues point us away from common temptations to vice and how they point us toward effective techniques for thriving in life. In my talks, I wanna highlight the essential issue that makes each virtue worth cultivating as a distinct principle. And I wanna help you all meditate on the practical implications of putting each principle into action. And so without further ado, I'd like to turn to today's first, uh, the, the today's topic, which is the first of our eight virtues that I wanna talk about, which is pride. And why am I doing pride first? I just wanna say, I'm doing pride first because, um, uh, because objectivism is a radical philosophy and the way it treats pride shows more than any of the other virtues, really, how radical its approach is. Because uh, not only is objectivism somewhat distinctive among philosophies, though not unique, in viewing pride as a virtue, the virtue of pride itself is a cardinal virtue, the cardinal virtue that corresponds to the cardinal value of self-esteem. And the cardinal value of self-esteem in the objectivist ethics is the cardinal value most tightly tied to the egoism of the objectivist ethics, to the fact that the objectivist ethics is about your benefit, your esteem, uh, your life, your thriving. And pride is the virtue most tightly associated with that. So it's a great place to start because we start with the choice to live with the, the basic attitude of the objectivist ethics, which is, uh, yes, you come first. I'd like to start just by reading what uh, Ayn Rand says about pride in Atlas Shrugged, where she summarizes it. And I'm going to be coming back to the, uh, to the sections of this that are highlighted, because each of them is an essential idea about pride that deserves more discussion. Uh, Rand says, pride is the recognition that you are your own highest value. And like all of man's values, it has to be earned. That of any uh, of the achievements open to you, the one that makes all others possible is the creation of your own character. That to live requires a sense of self-value, but man who has no automatic values has no automatic sense of self-esteem and must earn it by shaping his soul in the image of his moral ideal. That the first precondition of self-esteem is that radiant selfishness of soul which desires the best of all things in values of matter and spirit a soul that seeks above all else to achieve its own moral perfection, valuing nothing higher than itself. Radiant selfishness of soul. That's a signal characteristic of the heroes of Rand's novels. In The Fountainhead, for example, when Howard Rourke, the hero, walks into a room, people see him and they call him arrogant and conceited. But that's his pride showing through. Now, I wanna come back to the four points I highlighted in this uh, description of Rand's uh, shortly uh, to explain them in more detail. But first, I just wanna remark for a second uh, how we can see just from this description of, of pride the way uh, that objectivism is just not a traditional ethic. Some ethical systems in the past certainly have considered pride a virtue the most notable among these is the ethics of Aristotle. But pride is accounted a vice in most moral theories. It's one of the seven deadly sins of the Western tradition, for example. But the objectivist view of pride doesn't have to square with any received tradition. That's because the whole objectivist ethics is revisionist. The objectivist morality is derived from the facts of reality, plain, ordinary, observable facts. It doesn't derive from the commandments of God it doesn't derive, like the ethics of Immanuel Kant, from the formulation of universal rules detached from all particular facts about human beings. It doesn't derive 
like the maxims of the ethicist column in the New York Times Magazine, from a vague, contradictory hodgepodge of intuitions about right and wrong. I find the ethicist column very hard to read because I never know where he's going to come down, you know, how he's, how he's breakfast digested that morning when he wrote his column, you know, what intuition is going to move him uh, today when he answers a question. But this means ultimately uh, that uh, while traditional ethical ideas are worthy of consideration, in the end, all ethics must square with the facts. If the facts indicate that something is good, even though many people have called it bad, well then so be it. Since most traditional moral ideas derive from dubious sources such as revelations and intuitions, it's possible that they can be found to be wrong in some respect. And if so, they just have to be revised. So, we can see by looking more closely at Rand's idea of pride how we do that revising. In her uh, description of pride, Rand says that you are your own highest value. Well, Rand called her collection of ethical writings the virtue of selfishness. She knew when she wrote it that most people thought of selfishness as grasping and short-sighted, rude and violent behavior. But Rand wanted her readers to think more precisely. She wrote, the exact meaning of selfishness is concern for one's own interests. <clears throat> Objectivism derives its ethics from the basic facts of human life. First, that we're living beings. Second, that we act by choice. Third, that we're rational beings who must think long range to determine our values and resolve our problems. Thus, objectivism is an ethic of absolute, thoroughgoing, rational selfishness. And pride is the virtue of rational selfishness par excellence. It is, in essence, the virtue of being selfish. And that's why the first principle of pride is that you are your own highest value. Pride is a commitment to achieving the ultimate value of your own life and happiness. Now you may ask, why should you choose your life rather than duty to God or the categorical imperative as the goal of morality? And the answer to that is, of course, that the choice of life for death is fundamental. And this is what Rand means when she writes that like all of man's values, your life has to be earned. She means that life is a process of self-generated and self-sustaining action. To live is to continually act to support your life. You act to breathe, you act to find food, you act to ingest it, and over long range, keeping healthy, making the money you need, planning for retirement, these are all things that require action. And furthermore, being happy, achieving happiness, it isn't a state. It isn't something that just happens to you. You don't wake up one morning just plain happy for the rest of your life. Happiness is something you do. It's friendships you enjoy and love you make. Your happiness comes from the goals you reach, like succeeding at work or at school. To not act is to not reach those goals, to not go out with friends, to not do your work. Not to act is to not be able to be happy. So for you as a human being, every moment you live is a choice, a choice to get up in the morning, a choice to eat or not eat, a choice to sit or stand, a choice to listen or drift off, a choice to work or play, a choice to plan for the future or not, or to follow your plans or not. And living is a choice then. Logically, at the base of morality, it's a single choice to live. If you choose to live, then logically, it's right for you to act for your own life. It's right that you seek happiness. It's virtuous to be selfish. One of the key aspects of this uh, commitment to living for your own life is a rejection of altruism. It's a rejection of the doctrine that the ultimate intended beneficiaries of one's actions should be others. Altruism says your happiness doesn't matter, it's the happiness of other people that matters. And that it says that the best use of your life is to give it for others. The virtue of pride is particularly important uh, as a virtue of asserting yourself and your own 
a right to your own moral right to live and be happy. At its base are some very basic commitments, like the commitment to reject altruism and to live for your own happiness and your own well-being. So we've seen, in talking about this, that objectivism has a, distinct, a distinctive and revisionist approach to ethics. We see this especially in the virtue of pride because pride is the virtue associated with upholding oneself, one's own life and happiness, as the highest moral value. We take pride in ourselves fundamentally because we choose life over death, we choose happiness over self-sacrifice. Now, I want to turn to understanding the virtue of pride a bit more profoundly. As a virtue, pride is a set of practices we perform, a policy of action that we follow. All virtues are policies of action that we follow. Now, pride is a policy of action we follow that yields us the emotional and attitudinal expression of the choice to live, which is self-esteem, which is the inviolable certainty that one is worthy and capable of living. Ayn Rand summarized this point in the third fundamental element of pride uh, that I've extracted from Galt's speech. This is that to live requires a sense of self-value. One clear evidence of the fact that we act by choice is that we have no automatic values. Now many people don't feel like they make many choices and they don't act like it either. They have the same friends, work the same job, doing the same kind of thing that they're supposed to do, watch the same kind of shows. They change their behavior most when someone or, someone or, someone or something else pushes them, such as when prices go up and they change what they buy or when their boss demands new work from them and they change their work habits. But you know, you do choose what you do. And to keep making those choices requires effort, especially when we don't do just what others expect of us, but try to do what's really best for our own lives. And the thing that keeps us going, the thing that gives us our best reason to keep doing the things we need to do, is our basic sense of self-respect or self-esteem. Now, I want to distinguish between two kinds of self-esteem. Well, what I'd like to call a basic self-esteem and a robust, developed self-esteem. In its most fundamental sense, uh, this, uh, uh, or as you might say its most basic sense, our self-esteem summarizes our basic choice to keep living. It's your basic self-respect that makes you take the next step when the lights short out and the plumbing in your bathroom leaks and turning your floor into a lake. It's self-esteem is why you don't give up and sit there in the puddle crying. I've known people who do that. When the lights short out and the plumbing floods, they sit in the puddle and they cry. But your self-esteem is what, whether you cry or not, is that basic, your basic self-esteem is what makes yourself pick, you, pick yourself up and say, I can do better than this. I'm worth it. The next effort is worth making. It's the kind of motivation that carries you through some of the most difficult times in your life and gets you up to, to undertake the challenges of life. It's a spur that keeps you um, motivated towards uh, improving your life and doing things well. It's that basic sense of self-respect that I deserve it and I'm worth it no matter what. Your basic self-esteem is what makes you keep going when everything's at its worst, when your marriage has failed, when you failed in school or your job, when you've lost your home when your child has died. And why don't you give up? You don't give up because you refuse to accept that your life is not worth living. And in this sense, as Nathaniel Brandon has written, uh, fundamental self-esteem is like a psychological immune system. Of course, self-esteem is not only for the worst times, and the basic fact that you choose to live will only carry you so far psychologically. 
this basic self-esteem, you know, it's not the full picture and it's not enough to keep you motivated in your life. To keep you motivated to act and to keep you centered on the value of your own happiness, you need a more robust, fully developed sense of self-esteem. A robust self-esteem is what lies behind confidence. A person of self-esteem knows that he's able to handle the problems the world throws at him and that he deserves to have good results from his actions. A robust sense of self-esteem gives you motivation to do your best to be the hero of your own life. It's the only life you have, after all. <clears throat> As Ayn Rand says, the first precondition of self-esteem is that radiant selfishness of soul which desires the best of all things, valuing nothing higher than itself. When you want to be the best of all things, you want to live as your moral ideal, and you aspire to the best. I want to talk a minute about how selfishness and a, and a proud uh, attitude of self-esteem works in a social situation. It, to traditional ethicists, and particularly Christian ethicists, to be proud is to look down on other people. This reflects a common package deal in our culture, that a selfish, self-interested person must be rude, a braggart, cruel and grasping. And to be sure, to hold yourself as your highest value is to not put any other person higher. You're not morally in servitude to others. Your moral work hangs on your life, your deeds, your happiness. Your happiness is ultimately something you achieve in reality. Others can't give it to you. If you don't earn it, and you certainly can't take happiness from other people. In The Fountainhead, Howard Rourke is called arrogant by people that don't understand him. But in, this, but in the novel, this is because his confidence and his indifference to social pressure makes many small-minded people nervous. It's because when he comes into a room, he's not looking to play the room. He's just being himself. So it's important to point out uh, what it means to be selfish in public in this sense. In other words, what does it mean to be selfish in society? How does a person of self-esteem treat others? How does he represent himself to others? Well, in the first place, you don't show self-esteem by being a braggart. A person's self-esteem is respect, a person's self-esteem is respect for that person, for yourself. It's not comparative. It doesn't require you to be better than others. And it certainly doesn't require making others think that you're better. It's a sign of self-esteem to say, I'm the best in my class when in fact you are the best in your class and the person you're talking to wants to or needs to know that. It's the right thing to say in a job interview if it's true because they're asking what are you particularly good at. But it's the wrong thing to say in most other contexts uh, if the people aren't interested in the information and it's certainly wrong to say if it's false. For example, it's not the right thing to say at a cocktail party. You don't walk around the cocktail party saying, well, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm the best in my class. You don't do that because if, you're in, if you have self-esteem, you're interested in what benefit you can gain from the party and from interacting with the other people. You want to meet people, learn from them, laugh, and so on. You're not just there to try and impress them. You're there to have a positive relation. And your status doesn't depend on showing that you're better than anyone. But now, if you respect yourself, you're not humble either. This is part of the traditional package deal, that if you're not going to be a braggart, then you ought to go around being humble. You say, well, I don't know why I hit that home run in the World Series and won the game, because, oh, thank the good Lord, and I'm humble. Oh, it wasn't nothing. I didn't do nothing. I didn't practice for years and years and years and years and work like the devil. And I didn't try and beat out you know, hundreds of other people to get this job. And I didn't just fret all night before the big game. And I didn't concentrate like hell when that pitch came. No, sir, I, I just I didn't do nothing. Whatever your accomplishments, whatever you've achieved, you shouldn't be ashamed of them. Humility is a crucial virtue to many religions because if one truly accepts the idea of an all-powerful God, one must be humble or awestruck in the face of that power. And secular thinkers often say we must be humble too. We must look out for the size of our world, the size of its population, 
the number of planets and stars in our galaxy, the vast number of galaxies themselves. We must look on all that and feel ourselves insignificant, impermanent, irrelevant. Now, as, of course, from the perspective of a bacterium, each one of us is a god. But the point is that you're not insignificant to you. You are your own meeting. The world is for you in your lifetime. It's what you do that counts. This attitude is the key to the proper pro posture towards others. We shouldn't be shy about our own real needs and accomplishments where a useful purpose can be served by informing others. It's not bragging to speak the truth about oneself, and if one must err, err on the side of making oneself known to others. After all, if your real traits aren't known, how can others respond to your real knowledge, your real interests, your real, your real, real skills, and your real needs? When this basic approach to others is conducted with the sensitivity that recognizes when to talk and when to listen, and when it's conducted with a recognition that others don't exist to serve us any more than we exist to serve them, the result is an upright and productive relationship with society in which the best relationships are founded on mutual recognition and respect. So how does the selfish person comport himself at a party? Is he rude? Well, why? He's at the party to meet other people. There's no point in seeking to offend them. Does he boast? Well, no, he's honest about himself. Does he hide his interests and ideas? No, he seeks friends, business associates, and conversation partners that care about the things that matter to him. Since a selfish person doesn't serve others, perhaps he might like to go to parties simply to crash them, to break up the society there, to rub his self-esteem in their faces. Do you think so? Well. If it was a meeting of, tr of a truly deeply evil group, like the Nazi party or an Al-Qaeda cell, then maybe the person of self-esteem could derive some value by disrupting it, or at least uh, achieve the prevention of a disvalue. But generally, a selfish, a selfish person would not lower himself to making a misery of others as his goal. Abuse of others is not selfish. It's a sure sign that one thinks others are more important than oneself and that one has to drag them down. And rationally selfish people are too, too selfish for that. So self-esteem, this sense that one's worthy and that one's competent, the basic sense that one uh, has a right to live and a right to seek happiness. Uh, is the value that pride as a virtue is uh, designed to help us secure and maintain. And we need a uh, virtue of pride because it's, it's, it's not automatic to achieve a balanced and objective sense of self-esteem. We need the confidence of a Rourke, not the boasting of a Keating. We need the forthright sociability of Austin Heller, not the manipulations and abusiveness of a Gail Winand. And we cannot get objective, balanced self-esteem without making the effort to earn it. Making that effort is the policy of pride. This is the definition of pride from uh, uh, the Logical Structure of Objectivism book that uh, David Kelly and I have been working on. Uh, we offer this definition, that pride is a policy of achieving objective self-esteem by taking credit and responsibility for acting on one's judgment in accordance with moral principles. There's a couple things to point out about what this definition is saying. First, what's the genus? It, it's a policy, a policy of action. Right? All virtues are policies of action. So it's a, it's a policy of action. And it's distinguished by the goal that it aims at and the means that one uses. And it, the qualification that uh, you, you, you act on this policy in accordance with moral principles is very important because um, in practicing pride, the rest of the ethics and the rest of what we think is morally right uh, becomes very important. The virtue of pride preserves one's need for two forms of positive self-assessment that are mentioned here in the, in the definition. These, these two uh, constitute self-esteem. They are, on the one hand, the need to regard oneself as competent to act, and on the other hand, the need to regard oneself as worthy of being the beneficiary of that action. 
So on the one hand, pride results in a positive assessment of one's actions. And this, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, and this accords to the co competency aspect of self-esteem. But on the other hand, pride results in esteem of oneself as the author of those actions, particularly moral esteem. So that pride results in be able, being able to look at one's accomplishments and say both, I did it and it is good. I did it and it's good. Now I want to make sure you clearly understand this distinction. Just competency means being able to achieve your goals, whatever they are, no matter what their moral status. Gail Winand in The Fountainhead has competency because he is, an, is the effective master of his business empire. Worthiness, on the other hand, reflects the moral status of the ends you try to achieve. This can be a little confusing because competence is a virtue in itself and of course objectivism doesn't accept a distinction between the moral and the practical. Still, there's a difference between the instrumental competency and ability to get something done and the, the status of your ends as morally worthy. And so you could put competence to work for the wrong ends as Winan does in The Fountainhead and so it's a virtue, and that would be putting uh, an element of the virtue in the service of vice. So we need to check both whether we're able to do something, that's competency, and whether it's a good thing to do, that's worthiness. So if we bear this distinction in mind, we need to turn to another distinction that's important to the policy of pride. And this is the distinction between pride in the past and pride for the future. Pride is a commitment to achieving a positive assessment of oneself in the full context of one's life. And that assessment consists in two essentially distinct perspectives, looking backward and looking forward in time. These two perspectives provide one with the objective appreciation of one's past accomplishments and the commitment to success in the future on the other hand. Let's begin with pride in the past. As an overall policy, pride is the practice of taking credit and responsibility for one's acts. So pride in the past consists in taking credit, credit for one's specific achievements, pausing to recognize oneself with either I did it or that is good. And it consists in taking responsibility for one's failings of both competence and worth. Sometimes you have to admit, I didn't get it done and it wasn't good. And one doesn't need to only look on one's, uh, own, <clears throat> on one's acts in making this self-assessment. In this retrospective sense, one can also take credit as a self-made being for simply being who one is. This includes taking credit for one's accomplishments of character and personal development, as well as particular concrete actions one's, one, one has done. So you can look back on yourself and the way you are and say, I did it and it's good. A real self-esteem and objective self-esteem is built up out of respect for what you actually have done. Certainly, as I've said, there's a basic sense of self-esteem that should be ineliminable. When you choose to live, you choose yourself as worthy and you never give that up and you never leave yourself in despondency uh, in a puddle on the bathroom floor. But this can only carry you so far. To have a robust self-esteem, you have to appreciate the things uh, that you are and do that are, com that, uh, that are competent and uh, worthy. You need to celebrate the things that you achieve and the growth you show. We appreciate those moments when we can say, I did it and this is good. In The Fountainhead, Ayn Rand calls these stops in the process of life, like great stations that celebrate the great cities along a railroad. Stops are a moment when you have accomplished the best. We need a practice of reflecting on these, remembering them, and appreciating them. We may have key life moments at graduations or job promotions, or when a project is complete, a ditch is dug, a dress sewed, a drawing made, a book finally is published at last, or we may have them during a life-changing daybreak on a Hawaiian beach, or strolling through the surf and seeing the golden light on the sand. However these emotional stopping points come, it's important to record them and reflect on them. Photo albums, web pages, and other records help bring them back to mind. One useful tool might be a journal 
or a day log which can record your interview of those moments. I know certainly nothing connects me more with my own important moments than looking back on uh, journals I've written. Uh, great moments are key components of happiness and keeping records of them uh, has many functions. Using them pr proudly, that is, as part of the practice of pride, means reflecting on what they mean about your competence and worthiness. Your achievements are the objective record of the meaning of you. Of course, objective reflection on oneself is not necessarily going to always come up roses. Pride is not merely a practice of praising yourself. That's the pseudo self-esteem that they teach in our elementary schools where every child is supposed to say, I'm super wonderful in every aspect of my life and I'm really the best. Well, every child is wonderful. Every child is worthy of life. Every child deserves to live and be happy. Uh, and uh, every child's life is worth the effort that child ought to make to live and be better, certainly. But that doesn't mean that everything the child does is right. It doesn't mean that everything they do is the best. So how can you be proud if you have nothing to be proud of? Well, essentially you do this by taking responsibility for your shortcomings. It's important to note that the first response to existential or moral failure of a person of self-esteem is neither guilt nor idle remorse. Uh, Aristotle remarks in the Nicomachean Ethics that shame isn't a virtue. Shame isn't a virtue because it's a feeling you feel when you've done wrong. Well, and if you're virtuous, you just shouldn't do wrong. I think that's right. And I think it's right, it's not good for a person of self-esteem to feel a shame or, or guilt. What's much more important is to try and recognize what happened and try and improve and correct for the future. The only way to repair our sense of ourselves is to really work to correct or remove the fault and its effects as best we can. So, in short, we should recognize our, fa our failings as a springboard for the future. We can do that by taking responsibility for, for repairing any harms that we've done. We can do that by fixing the problem if we've caused a problem, like by apologizing for unjustified insults that you may have given, or replace that thing you broke, or return the thing that you borrowed, or correct that pathetic report you handed in, or the buggy code. Treat that employee with more consideration or provide him or her, her with the needed criticism that you had wimped out on in the annual review. And you also, uh, you also address your failings by putting improvement on your agenda. You commit to come back to it later. And we'll discuss the, what you do to come back to it later. Uh, but first I want to turn to an issue that affects how we evaluate ourselves. And this is the issue of how you see yourself in a social context. I mean, most people measure themselves with respect to other people. And this is natural. We're raised in society and we live in society. Our first moral teachers were our parents in most cases. We don't imbibe our first conscious sense of worthiness or blame through our encounters with non-human reality, but from other people. So it's natural for us to measure our success in comparison to other people. It's natural for us to judge our moral worth by the praise we receive from others. Others can help us set standards for ourselves. They can indicate to us what is possible and expand our grasp of the tasks that we might accomplish or skills we might master. When we see that other people can do something, we know that maybe we can do it too. If you see that other people like you can do it, you know even more that it might be possible for you. And other people can be moral models to us, embodying traits of character that we might admire and may seek to emulate. But, this role, but in this role, others are evidence. They suggest possibilities to us. But ourselves and our values are the standards for us. We may admire the talent of another, for example, but we can recognize that we're not falling short of our potential when we can't reach that level because we don't have that talent. For instance, I can take pride in my improved foul shots in basketball, despite the fact that I will never be a Kobe Bryant. And I may admire a player of Bryant's skill, but I'm living my life, not his, in my body, not his, 
for my values, not his. And so it goes in many areas of life. Others can demonstrate to me career paths I might consider, but how much I should earn and what jobs I can and should do and should do well are up to me. Others can have great romances, but am I of the temperament to go about it the way someone else did? Maybe, maybe not. So I want to suggest a meditation to keep yourself centered on pride in your own accomplishments despite the pressure of social standards. First, remind yourself of your starting place. Accept yourself as you are. Know what you're capable of and what right now you can't do. Second, remind yourself of your values and goals. What are you trying to get to? What are you trying to do? And third, look at your progress in your own terms. Don't let the accomplishments of others impact your self-evaluation. If it impacts anything, let it inform your choice of possible goals. So here's how this works. You've never been a great talker, and last night you gave a speech. Well, then don't hold yourself up to the standard of the best speakers ever. Hold yourself to the standard of the goal you could be expected to achieve if you did your best. You should aim to do better, too, the next time, but that's something to save for later. You're a competent investor, maybe. You've done decently, you've made some decent earnings, so you're not Warren Buffett. So what? Sure, you could be a better investor, maybe, but save that for later. You're the best assistant in your office, and you get done easily what all the others grouse about and barely get done, and that they don't do well. Well, then don't lower yourself to their standard. You know what you can do. Did you do it? And you should think about getting a promotion, too, but save that for later. Or consider this example. Your sorority mates are all liars. They boast and gossip const constantly. Don't be so proud of yourself for just telling the occasional fib or just making up malicious gossip when your friends do. You're morally better than them, but so what? You know what your principles are. And maybe you should reassess your friends and their values, but save that for later. So that's it. Focus on your capabilities and principles by the standard of your life and happiness. Judge, for your, judge yourself by you, not by the standard of others. Does that mean you should be self-satisfied? Should you coast along fat and content, never raising the bar? Absolutely not. But when you take responsibility for your shortcomings and take credit for your accomplishments, do it selfishly for your own sake and save raising the bar for later. For how much later? A minute, a week, a month, not too long. Taking responsibility and credit for the past is only half the task of achieving a robust self-esteem. The other half, uh, perhaps the better half, is self-improvement for the future. Just as you have to consciously make the effort to reflect on your past and assess yourself, you have to consciously make a separate effort, building on the first, to make yourself better and nobler as time goes by. As an orientation towards the future, pride consists in taking responsibility for enhancing one's self-esteem, for building one's character, for being worthy of life. You can't very well take credit for what you haven't done yet, and I suppose you can't take credit, uh, but I suppose you can take credit for cleaving to your ideals. Pride for the future means striving for moral and existential improvement, with oneself as the beneficiary. It means striving to do the right thing and making improvements in your ability to get things done. In effect, <clears throat> then, <clears throat> it involves both existential improvement uh, and moral ambitiousness. Existential improvement means developing your skills and abilities. For example, this means taking responsibility for your material success in professional development by seeing to it that you pursue an enriching career or a method of living that will help you become more what you want to be. It means looking for that promotion if you deserve it or learning how to earn it if you don't deserve it but see that you could. The other aspect of self-improvement for the future is moral ambitiousness, which is taking responsibility for one's moral development. 
It means being guided by your values, the values that support your life. And especially moral development means honing the virtues in yourself that you can use to achieve those values. This is not something you can leave to others. You're ultimately responsible for your own character and choices. You may look to others for a sense of what might be possible, as we've noted. You might look to others or to philosophy or to art for inspiration. You can picture your ideal and try to make yourself more that way. You might admire a hero in a Rand novel. You might admire a heroic inventor like Thomas Edison or Ben Franklin. You might be inspired by Aristotle's account of courage. But the same caveats apply. Don't just accept what others do as the standard for you. Don't just accept what you see in an artwork as the standard for you. They can be your inspiration, but your ambition must be appropriate to you. Aim as high as you dare, if you sincerely mean to dare. And don't let others hold you back by their second-rate standards. Don't take no for an answer. You decide what you're going to be. Here are some steps that you might employ to seek your moral self-improvement. I would say start out by envisioning your ideal without conditions. Let's say you admire Ben Franklin and want to combine in your life his successes as a writer, publisher, scientist, statesman, and friend. It's a noble ideal. He lived an excellent life. Add some conditions. Put the ideal on Earth, growing out of your shoes. Now, you're not Ben Franklin. Science requires more complicated mastery now than it did in his time. There isn't a crying need for new publishers from the public, as there was when Franklin moved to Philadelphia to open his print shop and print a newspaper. Being a statesman is a career in itself now, and wholehearted pursuit of any career will come at some expense to your friendships. So you may need to focus your goals more. Try to find out where your aptitude really lies. Do you like writing all day? Do you like the social interaction of politics? Can you stand the hurly-burly of political debate and the horse trading that is part of even a principled political career? Perhaps you love research science, or perhaps you most love inventing. Franklin did both of those things, for example. Then identify areas where you fall short of this more realistic standard you've been envisioning. Let's say you settle on science and invention, and you will give friendship as much time as, as, much time as you've given to those goals. Now, you might ask, what did Franklin do to keep himself on track? Well, for one thing, he defined for himself the virtues necessary to his success in achieving his goals. And he made a journal in which he recorded his virtue principles and his successes in achieving them. And these include taking practical steps, like studying your subject matter hard and making efforts to make new friends. This is a practice that you could implement, too, to realistically track your progress to your goal and not just your, your practical progress, but your moral progress, the development of your character. Fourth, identify your next step. Franklin focused on one virtue at a time when he was young. It might be a good idea for you to take it one step at a time, too. Pick a goal you can achieve in a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable amount of effort. But consider stretching yourself if you seek to improve. Fifth, monitor your progress objectively through pride in your past. Use the steps of self-assessment we discussed earlier to check how you're doing. Franklin recorded the results in his journal. Find a way of identifying your progress objectively and take credit for your successes. Your self-esteem is being enhanced already. You're more existentially competent and you're seeking more moral goals. At least I hope so. And finally, correct and implement. Go back at least to step three, identifying where you fall short, and then go on to plan your next step and monitor your progress again, and then correct and implement again, and so on. Your respect for yourself is growing with every cycle. You're getting into a stride like the little engine that could. I did it, and it is good, and I did it, and it is good. Remember always, virtue is not a goal you reach. It's something you do. You do it every day. You may not achieve your ideal, but, you will be a living, uh, but it will be a living ideal, never a dead-end state. You know, in the children's story, the little engine that could reaches the other side of the mountain, and the story ends there. But you know that all real little engines are going to go back over the mountain to the train yard on the other side. And they may call, be, be called upon to cross the mountain regularly from now on. And that's living your improvements, 
living your ideal through the continued motion of your life. At root, we've seen that the virtue of pride springs from the choice to live. The choice of one's basic happiness is one's highest moral purpose. The basic expression of this act of moral self-assertion is the core of self-esteem that refuses to accept defeat or immorality in oneself. The branch is the robust self-esteem engendered by the practices of pride, the practice of taking credit for one's achievements, the practice of taking responsibility for one's failings, and the practice of taking responsibility for moral and practical self-improvement, enhancing your skills and prospects, and enhancing your capacity for virtue. That's the practice of pride and the practice of building up in yourself, the self-esteem that will motivate yourself through your life and help you achieve your happiness uh, and excellence in life. Thank you very much. If we have a couple Do questions. Do we have time for a couple questions? Oh, uh, if, yeah, I mean, we one can squeeze two. them in. Yeah, maybe one. One or two questions if you have them, please. Please use the, the microphone at the back. I thought you had some good lines and some very useful tips, but there was one comment that, or, you know, that struck me. Uh, from the definition from the LSO, uh, you said, in accordance with moral principles. And that sounded an awful lot like a side constraint view of morality, which is very much contrary to a lot of the rest of what you said in the lecture, and certainly to my understanding of the objectivist account of morality. So I'd like to ask you to elaborate on why you use this kind of phrasing um, and why it isn't something more like through moral principles. Oh, I see what you're asking. I'm sorry, I thought you were asking a different question. Um, uh, I understand. So you're asking why do, do, do we say in accordance with moral principles rather than through moral principles? Why the suggestion that... That's a good suggestion. You know, and particularly when you talked about um, worthiness, there seemed to be an implication that there could be something practical and immoral. Well, people achieve a uh, sense, uh, at least a, a partial sense of self-esteem and a sense of happiness in life through the achievement of goals that they consider to be worthy. And people can be extremely proud in an emotional sense. They can have a strong sense of the worthiness of their own actions, a strong sense that they're, comp that they're competent, even though what they're doing uh, is destructive and evil um, in, in vision uh, a brilliant general in the SS in World War II. Uh, think about um, a daring guerrilla fighter in uh, fighting for the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, people may be very morally invested when they do that. Pride as a virtue. That's why y you can't say um, I'm going to do a moral. Uh, I'm going to. I'm. I'm going to support my character simply by doing things that uh, seem to me to give me self-esteem. You need uh, an objective understanding of why something is a virtue and why you need it, and why something is morally worthy and why it isn't. And as we'll, we'll be discussing other virtues, we'll be discussing why they are uh, uh, candidates for being considered morally worthy. Um, I don't actually object to your uh, you suggested that instead of saying in accordance with moral principles, we might say through moral principles. I, that's, a, that's a word choice, and if I, I don't have a, that sounds like a good suggestion to me. Uh, I have to think about it more to reach a final decision, but uh, it sounds like a good decision, a good suggestion to me. Thank you. Thank you.